my strength, I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not waver walking by faith. He will be strong to deliver me safe. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of Well, good morning, folks. It's good to be with you again. August the 1st. Can you imagine that? August the 1st. I'm praying that this August will be your best August ever and that God will bless you and shine his favor on you in a really powerful and wonderful way. I'm going to talk to you today more about the favor of God. We're going to talk more about uh, how man has messed things up, how God has redeemed us through Jesus the Christ and through his blood and and the beauty there and then certainly is that we need to find the joy of that spirit once again in our lives and so let's be thinking about that today as we get ready to worship together and sing some more songs together and commune together and all those things but help us to remember that we have the joy of the Lord and the joy of the Lord is my strength amen all right talk to you in a little bit see you then bye bye Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. 
Lord, oh my soul, I will worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I will worship Your holy name. Your rich in love and Your slow to anger. Your name is great and Your heart is kind. For all Your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy name. strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending, ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. chapter 13 uh, 
I was going to, I'll, I'll read this a little bit to you, verse, first seven verses. It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. And after Jesus had done this, this menial task of washing their feet, a little bit later in the evening, I don't know, you don't know how long this lasted, whatever. But then he starts talking to them about the meal and about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. So, and of course, this whole scenario, everybody was on high tension. If they, they can't figure out, what is he talking about? What's, what's going on? And uh, so it's, that's kind of the setting that's, uh, that's going on right about here. And then I'm gonna read something in John 14. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do not know him and have seen him. Uh, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip answered, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The, uh, the act of Jesus washing the disciples' feet was Jesus cleansing the body, the outer body. And they didn't understand what was going on. And then Jesus was crucified. And his blood was... His blood was shed on the cross. And what did that blood do? It washed our souls. So God and Jesus, being one in spirit, washed our body and our spirit, made us completely clean. And we take these emblems because we're so foolish that we forget these things. Help us to remember, so let us pray for the bread. Dear God, our Father, we come to you at this time, remembering at this time of the sacrifice that you made of giving your Son and Jesus, the sacrifice of, that you made of going to the cross and enduring that cruel, painful death and having your body broken. Bless this bread and help us to remember it's in the name of Jesus. Amen.
continue in prayer. Dear Lord God, Father, we come to you and, and we're so grateful that we're clean before you because of the blood of Christ. Help us to remember that as we take and drink this fruit of the vine. It's in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now we'll offer a prayer for uh, the contribution. Of course, there are several different ways that we can contribute. We can contribute physically, or we can contribute uh, spiritually. And uh, of course, there's a basket in the back if you want to give the money or, or however you want to do it. And let's pray at this time. Dear God, our Holy Father, we are so blessed. We are blessed by so many ways that we can't even conceive them. And Father, at this time, we ask that you would bless the things that we give back to you and help them to be used in a way that will glorify you. It's in the name of Jesus. Amen. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us see. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hand. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in My Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath all that I am never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your sing for joy at the work of your hand. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Well, welcome back, folks. It's good to see you again. Uh, great to be with you, I should say. I always say that, good to see you again, as though I can see you out there. But you're seeing me, but I'm not seeing you. Well, I hope you're enjoying your coffee today and your donut or whatever it is, and you're ready to hear God's Word, because I'm certainly ready to preach God's Word, okay? That's a good deal. All right. Peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, the man said. That's all I ever get for lunch is the same thing, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. To which his friend simply said, Well, why don't you have your wife pack something different for your lunch? He said, My wife? I pack my lunch. <laughs> What's my point here? If we can do something about the mess that we are in, Shouldn't we? Think about that. Because we're in a mess. What I want to do today is what I want to give you today, and perhaps you've been following along with these messages on impact in the world, Operation Impact, and what we're called to do by God, of course. 
So I want to give you a combination of the things that we've kind of been talking about. You know, we've been over in the book of Daniel, we've been looking at Daniel, and we've been looking at the kings, and we've been looking at the last week, the favor of God, and uh, things that we mess up. And so that's why I just give this these three things. This, this, if you will, the mess of man, and the redemption of God, and then the joy of the Spirit. And those are things we need to continue, because basically that's what this is. It tells us we messed up. But it tells us there's a Redeemer. And then it tells us that we are to walk in the joy of the Spirit of God. Because we have God on our side. That's pretty much it. It sums it up, doesn't it? You see, what got the people in Daniel's day, if you go back during that time, during all the kings, what got people in Daniel's day in a mess was that the kings all said, we're going to do it my way. And all the people... All the people, they didn't stand in their faith. They didn't stand up for what was right in the eyes of God. And so they did exactly what the king said, or they just followed right along as a puppet on a string. The same thing is happening today. And again, people are going to say, well, you're political and you're saying this. Just, just relax. Because it happens today within the body of Christ. We are called to take a stand. We are called to take a stand for what is right. For if we don't, we too will fall as a nation. Therefore, the church will also take a major hit. It is because we, you and I, are called to be the ones that stand strong in the Lord so that we receive the blessing of God in our lives. When you choose not to stand up, you blend in. And when you blend in and that's all you do, you can't have an impact in the world that God's called you to have an impact in. You see the dilemma that we're in. You then only have this thing called uniformity. God has not called us to look like the world. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, God hasn't called us to look like the world in for a matter of fact, he hasn't called us to look like each other. He's called us to walk in obedience to the word of God and then to become more like Christ. We're, we're to take on his image so that when we go into the world, we can have the impact that God wants us to have. And I think we need to know that. Now, in that, in that process, we have to stay pure. We talked a little bit about that. You have to stay pure. One must stay with, to stay pure, one must stay in the will of God or within the boundaries of the Word of God. You can't just go out on a tangent and pick out things that you like and you don't like because that's what the kings were doing. And that's what messes up man. I just think God's okay with this and I think God's okay with that. Well, there are things in life that you can do that are okay. But there are certain things that God says, hey, listen, this is going to damage you. And one of those things is certainly the number one on the list is not following what he has given us to do in his word. Is that he must be first in our life. All right. So if you will, it's kind of like a purification system. And I want to talk about that real quick. He, Jesus, is the purification system, if you will. That we as a people need and certainly we as a nation need. This nation was built upon godly principles. And when those principles start flying out the window, if you will, then all of a sudden things get out of kilter. And it affects all of us in this great nation. In fact, he is the only purification system that is 100% guaranteed. This would be Jesus. Nothing can purify you except the blood of Jesus Christ. If that's true, and it is, according to Scripture, 1 John chapter 1, listen to what it says there. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, this fellowship with one another is important, but our fellowship comes through, our unity comes through, not looking alike, because we're, we're, we're not going to look alike. You may have different traditions, you may have different preferences, 
Our unity doesn't come in that, although some will teach that. you got to be exactly like me. Those are cookie-cutter churches. Those are cookie-cutter people. And that's not what God's called us to look like. God's called us to look like Christ, if you remember that. Our unity is found in one thing and one thing alone, and that is Jesus the Christ. There's where our unity comes. Now, he goes on to say, And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Not some sin, a little sin, the little bitty ones only, or not the big ones. No, 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 all sin. Praise God. Then those of us that call ourselves Christian, and I am Christ-like, then we must seek to that purification in our life, but we need it continually in our life. You remember Matthew chapter 6, six uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Also in Proverbs chapter 3, it teaches us we have to have God first in our life for us to stay pure in our life because that's that continual covering, if you will. The reason why we want that in our life is so that we can pass down the right description, the right prescription, if you will, to the next generation or to make an impact in the world. If we have the wrong prescription ourselves and we're not being bathed in that or taking the right prescription in our own lives, then we can only hand down to the next generation or to the world something that will not help them. For instance, the vaccinations that are out there. You know, there's percentages that they will help or may not help and so on and so forth. And you make a decision on that. Um, but they're only to a percentage. So people that even get the shots can also get the virus. We're finding that out all the time. But the percentages are lower. Well, God doesn't work like that. God wants you to be 100% sure that you are forgiven. But to walk in that forgiveness daily is something you have to walk in His Word or in the light, as He's told us in Scripture. Now, I think all of you understand the purification system and how it works, of course, and the pure, how pure water is needed. And we need to, to take out these impurities of those waters so that we can have something good into our system. If you were thirsty and you said, uh, give me a drink of water, and I took a glass of water and I put one little drop of sewage in it, and, but I, you didn't know it and I gave it to you, you wouldn't have a problem. You would just drink it down because I gave it to you. And you, would, you, you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at it. It just looks good, so you would drink it. But it's impure. And so what happens in our lives, the world, we're around the world, the people of the world, and Satan doing all the things that he's doing in the world. It's one little drop and one little drop and one little drop. And before long, we don't even notice what we're drinking, which is things that are impure in our life. So it contaminates us. And with that contamination comes um, harmful things into our lives. But God gives us his word and shows us what is pure and what is impure so we can keep the impure things out of our lives so that we can be pure before him. And that's important as well. So we invent, uh, so what we do as people, we've come along and we've invented these filtering systems to take out the impurities of our water so that you and I can feel comfortable about going to the sink, turning the water on and taking a drink and feeling, well, okay, it's okay. Well, that's a brilliant thing. So, but God wants us to understand that there are impurities within us that make us sick and will cause us diseases and it's a thing called sin, S-I-N, sin. Now, write this down. Sin is the destroyer of your soul. That's right. Sin is the destroyer of your soul. Sin is to the soul what stage four cancer is to the body. However, sin is not possibly curable. It is 100% curable because of Jesus Christ. Now, only Christ purifies, and when we are purified by Him, then what happens? Favor comes into our life that we talked about last week. And you like favor, the favor of God. I'm sure that you do. Do you have the favor of God in your life is the question. When I talked about this last week at church, 
There were several people that came up to me and talked to me about it. One person simply said, you know, I didn't realize that I could have the favor of God in my life today. But I'm thankful through Scripture that you've shown me that I can have favor, the favor of God in my life, just as much as Daniel did or Noah did or David did or whoever it was that we talked about. And that did my heart good. Another person told me, he said, you know, when you were talking about the favor of God in your life, I started re rehearsing these things of my own life. And they simply said, I, I looked back in my life and I saw the things that were happening in my life. And I realize now that was the favor of God in my life. Well, that does my heart good when people say those things because it means that God's word is moving into their life and they're recognizing where it all comes from. And I hope that it helps you as well. Listen to Proverbs and also Psalms here. Proverbs chapter 12, a good man obtains favor from the Lord. But no one's good. But Christ is perfect, and so that purification system, once again, what does it do for us? It allows us to be seen as good, so God shines His favor on us. And then that scripture does say, but the Lord condemns the crafty man. The crafty man here is the one that's, that's pretending. It's the, it's the one that's it's a hypocrite. It's the one that looks like it's pure water, but it's got a bunch of little drops inside of it. It, 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 it's really not true. So you can come to church and, or you can you know, sing the songs or do whatever it is and you can look all churchy. But that doesn't mean that you're good inside. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't know it because He does know it. Also in Psalms 5 it says, For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. There's that word again, righteous, that we talked about. You see, man messes up, so we have to have something righteous to clean us up which is the redeeming power of the blood of Jesus. So in this, you bless the righteous. Not me. I'm not righteous. Not in what I've done. Nope. But because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. You, you surround them with your favor as with a shield. And I like that. It's not only the favor, it's, but as a shield, it's a protection of. My good buddy Jim always, or many times in his prayers, he says... He prays for a protection or a hedge of protection, Lord. Give us a hedge of protection to keep us from the evil one. I simply say, God, build that hedge of protection so high that when Satan gets to the top, he's worn out. Because God wants to shield us. But he wants us to have his favor in our life. Give me an amen. All right. Now, some of you out there, you got this uh, verse last week. Some didn't. It just depends on what service you were in because time runs quickly. All right. I started too much talking. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin so that we might become, you and I might become the righteousness of God. And we say, Amen. Thank you, Lord. And then just a few verses later in chapter 6, it talks about, for he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you and the day of salvation, I helped you. So God's favor extended, watch this, God's favor extended to you when you accepted the salvation he offered you through his son, which was your purification system that you needed in your life. And we praise God for it. So he had favor on you. If you haven't received salvation, you need to know that his favor is still available. And somebody needs to hear that this week as well. It could be your friend that needs to hear that. That God wants to have favor in their life. God wants to have favor in your life. Now, if you haven't received that, why don't you just take him up on the offer? It's always God's call. God's call is the same. Come. Come to my favor. Come to my favor. Into my favor. I want to rescue you. And someone certainly needs to hear that. They need to, they need to have their life purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you do that by accepting what God gave you, which is His Son. But the world is going to tell you that's the silliest thing you could ever do. And so they mock at sin. But Scripture says in Proverbs 14, Fools mock at sin, 
but among the upright there is favor. Now, who is the upright? Well, if you remember last week in Romans chapter 14, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, that's the fleshly side, but righteousness and peace and the joy of the Holy Spirit. The upright is the one that stands in Christ Jesus or is clothed with him before God. Now, the lack of joy of the Holy Spirit in your life should be an indicator light, like on your dash of your car. Something's wrong in my life. And some of you out there are listening. L listen closely. Some of you out there have the lack of the joy of the Spirit in your life. And that indicator light has been going off for days or weeks or months. And you can ignore it all you want to. But there's a problem. And you need to address that problem. There's a reason why it's going off. There's a reason why you don't have that joy in you. It's because that righteousness of God, you're trying to look around the corner. You're trying to look around into the world instead of looking through Jesus. Righteousness, it means a right standing with God. Not me, but what God, Christ did for me. The opposite of that, of course, is sin in your life. Now, you've heard this many times, I'm sure, throughout your life. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it'll cost you more than you want to pay. And that's true, isn't it? It asks very little of you from the beginning. In the beginning, it's that one little drop. One little drop. But in the end, it leads to destruction. So see, if Satan can steal your righteousness by causing you to sin or get you to go towards sin, he will rob you or he will steal your joy. Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I mentioned that earlier in the service. You see, too many people, including Christians, try to find joy out there instead of in here. And then we wonder why we are not making an impact like we should out there. When you find the joy of the Lord, nothing else compares to it. Nothing. That is why God wants to get it to you. Micah chapter 7 verse 18. God wants you to have his joy. Did you know that? And that is precisely why Satan wants to steal it from you. Why do I say that? It's because when Satan steals your joy, it won't be long before you drift away from God. Did you know that there are many people in church that never express joy? They just don't express joy. And oftentimes it's because they are told it's sacrilegious. Now we don't maybe use that word some, but people make them feel that way. How sad that is. I mean, you think about it. Here is the message. One is told that Jesus saves, and he does. One is told that Jesus saves, and he does. And then they receive salvation. And then they are told to not celebrate or get too happy about it. How sad is that? But that kind of comes across in many places. I think one reason we don't express the joy of the Lord out there is because we don't express the joy of the Lord in here enough. But we're supposed to do everything in decency and order. You're right, we are. You don't need to be crazy, but you need to have joy. You need to express the joy of the Lord is my strength. A child once remarked to uh, her mother, she said that, she believed her friend went to heaven every night. Her mom said, well, what do you mean by that? She says, well, it's because she's so happy every day. Kids are happy. And when we see that even in church, this is what cracks me up. Uh, a lot of things crack me up, but <laughs> me. <laughs> but if we see kids in church and we see them getting excited about learning or singing the song or whatever it is, and, and we look at them and we say, oh, and look at that. I, that really excites me because they're excited. That really does my heart good to see them so excited. And then we, then we 
as adults. Hmm. Yeah. Are you finished yet? Okay. It's kind of silly, isn't it? First Peter chapter 1 says, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. You haven't seen Him, have you? I mean, you haven't really seen Him. You maybe see Him through things and the, the favor that He has in your life, but you haven't seen Him, but you love Him, don't you? Sure you do. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him, don't you? You, you believe in Him, don't you? Well, sure you do. So I believe in Him. I love Him. And I believe in Him. And then He says and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I, I love that. He, he could have just, the writer could have just said, and you believe in Him and are filled with joy. Because that's how we enjoy. No, an inexpressible and glorious joy. He has to add these extra words in there because you can't explain it, he's saying. It's just something you have to experience. And God wants you to experience that as well. Don't let Satan steal your joy. But let me say it this way as well. Don't let other Christians steal your joy. Please. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote these words. He says, I've been to church today and I'm not depressed. <laughs> and someone is saying, oh, well, I wish I could feel like that. Well, I hope that you feel like that today. The Bible says that Jesus was a man acquainted with sorrow and grief. He cried at Lazarus' tomb and he wept when he looked over at Jerusalem and they turned his back on him. And he's a man of sorrow and grief there is no doubt but I want you to know in John chapter 15 what Jesus said himself the red letter edition here buddy he says I want my joy to be in you so that your joy might be complete the joy of knowing Jesus you see the joy of the world offers and what the joy of the world offers can never be complete because it's always a false narrative can never end you up with what it says it's going to get you. Oh, you drink this stuff and you're going to just have all these. Nah. Oh, wear this. It's going to. Nah. You be this. It's going to be. Nah. Buy these shoes and you're going to jump like. Nah. False narratives. The joy of the Lord offers is complete. It's complete because it's always delivered by the promise of God. And God wants your joy to be complete. So He gave you Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. One of the greatest and most attractive qualities in a church or in a Christian is that of genuine joy. Just joy in that person. And I want our church, and I want wherever you might go to church, I want it to be a church that is known for the fellowship of joy in the Spirit of God. Because I want people to know that we're saved. If you can't be happy about anything else in the whole wide world, you should be able to express joy because you know you are saved. That is exciting to me. And that they can be too. And when they see the joy in us, and when what the world is offering today and all its blah, 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 blah stuff, and they see the joy in us, they're going to say, where did you get that joy at? Is that for sale? No, it's not for sale. But it's free. Free? Yeah. Free in Christ Jesus. And it's for you as well. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. Do you have that today? I pray that you do, my friend. Yep, truth is, we've messed it up. But praise God, He's redeemed us through the blood of the Lamb. And now we are to live our lives with great joy, knowing that we are the children of God, co-heirs with Christ, that He has favor on us, and that we can march into the world that is lost and dying 
And with all its lies and all its hurts and all its pains and all its sorrow, we can walk in with joy and simply say, Come on home. Come on home. For God wants to have favor on you as well. And God wants you to walk in joy. And the way you do that, my friend, is find Jesus. And you say, where is Jesus? He's right where you're at. And if you listen closely, He's calling you right now. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank You so much for Your presence. I thank You, Father, that in the mess that we are in, there's a salvation. There's a place of rest. There's a place of joy that we can go to. And I thank You most of all for Jesus. And I pray for that person out there today that has never accepted You. They're right on the line. They're wanting to do it, but the world is saying, help them to walk away from the foolishness of the world and walk into the joy of the Lord. Help them to receive what it is that you want for their life. And that is salvation through your Son and your Son alone. And when they receive that, Father, may they be filled with your Spirit and may they, may they be filled with the joy in their life, knowing that no matter what comes, they are children of yours and you will have favor on them in their lives. Thank you, Father. Bless the church. And we thank you for Jesus most of all. It's in His name we pray and believe. Amen and amen. Thanks again for tuning in today, folks. I'll talk to you next week, Lord willing. God bless. Bye-bye now. Be